Good evening and welcome to Free Media, Free Minds. Uh, today we're going to be having a look at an alternative media, a media that's not the dominant media that shapes the way we think about the world, uh, but a media that promotes a different way of looking at things. With me in the studio, I have uh, Anele Selequa, who's a media activist yeah. in Cape Town, Stacy Hardy from Chimurenga, and Rushni Ali from Radio 786. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Before we get into the discussion, though, we're going to have a look at an insert that uh, unpacks some of the issues. Let's take a look. We often forget that we are facing a global crisis. That crisis is impacting on South Africa in many different ways. Essentially, what is happening under the crisis is that a very small layer of people are becoming extremely powerful and rich and the vast majority of people are becoming very, very poor and marginalized. And so there's a struggle. There's a, a need for resistance to turn that around. There's a need for alternatives and alternative strategies, alternative perspectives. So we're desperately in need of a media that reflects what actually is taking place in our society and uh, what we should be doing about it. It's a, a media that needs to reflect on the existing struggles that are taking place and make sense of that and try to link up what people are doing in vastly different areas because they are actually intrinsically less, uh, linked. So you have people in uh, Soweto fighting against electricity uh, cutoffs, but you also have people fighting uh, against a World Bank loan for a Madupi coal-fired power station. Now these struggles come together uh, during, for example, COP17, where they're going to discuss uh, strategies to deal with the climate crisis. Well, the business elite and the ruling elite don't want to do anything that is necessary to uh, deal with the climate crisis. So the people fighting for electricity are intrinsically needing to find ways of uh, alternative electricity or energy uh, that isn't uh, undermining the integrity of the natural resources and nature and Mother Earth. So it's, it's one struggle and I can give you many different examples of, the, of, of this thing. So what we need to do is to tell the stories of these different struggles but to be able to link them and link them what's happening at a micro local level to these global issues. That's why I think we need a, a, a struggle media, an alternative media. Community media is extremely weak and vulnerable. It's got a lot of potential. Um, it's got a lit listenership. It's, it, it potentially has authenticity by being close to people. But I think what we find in, in South Africa at the moment is most of the community radio stations are very, very weak, financially, very limited capacity and the external environment in which it must operate is not conducive. So we need to look at an, uh, creating an enabling environment that can grow community media, but grow it as a media that tells a story that's not been told in the mainstream media. The mainstream media is simply regurgitating the ideas of the this very tiny ruling elite. So we are told that um, you know, the financial crisis requires the banks to be bailed out, we are, uh, and this is good for everybody and everybody will benefit. Whereas, of course, and it becomes plain when there's resistance like we see all over the world now, uh, in Wall Street, the occupation of uh, Wall Street and the movement of the 99% against the 1% telling us, no, no, it's actually... Uh, our crisis is part of the fact that this 1% of society, the extremely rich, have usurped all the wealth and all the resources and all the power and must be resisted. So it's these type of stories that our media should be telling um, and linking up to the day-to-day -day struggles of ordinary people. Well, Annele. I think when people hear the phrase alternative media, the first question that comes to mind is alternative to what? I suppose um, it has to do what ideas are out there. I mean, I think what I got from what Brian is trying to say um, is that the society is structured in a, in, in a, in a certain way. Um, and then 
there's um, a group of few people who have been enjoying um, a rule of the majority. Um, and they've done this, you know, in many ways, but I think, you know, media has played um, a main role in terms of shaping ideas and what people can actually accept. Um, and I suppose then, if we do have an alternative media, would, that would mean, you know, um, a media that challenges the ideas that exist um, from the dominant um, class or group of people. Sure. Yeah. Stacey, in what, in what senses is alternative media different to the commercial media that most people consume most of the time? I think that it, it, in far-reaching ways, I think that there's been a bit of a... There's a huge trend at the moment to say that we need to have a commercial media that is devalues people, that is stupid, that is easy to access, that is filled with um, no, basically non-intellectual <coughs> discussions, non-intellectual ideas. And I think that it's actually a bit of a myth. I think that essentially people do want good content. I think that people do want to, to read quality things. I think people value debate. I think in South Africa, as a country, we're an incredibly actually active. If you walk on the streets, there's always conversations. People have things to say. People have opinions. And yet we have a media, a mainstream media, that to a large extent is a very commercialized media, that to a large extent run by business um, and run by certain power structures and that actually puts out content that is largely stupid, that is largely a waste of people's time. So I think that it, it's very much in the content. I think that we need to start looking at what kind of content is being distributed and shared. Yeah. Um, a number of different analysts have concluded that the commercial media's main role is to kind of manufacture consent, get you to wake up in the morning and go to work every day. Yeah. And then to, when there is a social disruption, like the rape epidemic that we face, for example, the, the commercial media tries to explain it away, to normalize it. Mm. Uh, alternative media should be playing a different role. Mm. I mean, Rushni, Radio 786, what, how do you see your role as an alternative to the commercial? I think for us, it's, it's, for alternative media, it's, it's telling the story behind the story. Because obviously the commercial media is also um, uh, influenced by um, interest groups. So very often, at, we have an opportunity to tell the, 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 the story that's out there, that, that, that's at grassroots level. And also the, the other thing about alternative media is the, is the fact that, that you create access it's the point Stacy made now that we have a very um, intelligent community, but it's for us to create that access so that they can make informed decisions and not to dumb down people, mm. but to give them the alternatives to what the issues are and leave it up to them to decide what it is that would benefit them. Stacy, what are some of the kind of values that one would expect to find underpinning alternative media? Um. I would, I, I, I don't know if we can say what can I expect, I would say what I would like to have in alternative media. And I think for me it's creativity, it's putting out imaginative alternatives. I think that in our society at the moment we have a huge death of the imagination. We've somehow been led to believe that things are as they are, a newspaper must be this way and this is how a newspaper exists, this is what is on page one, this is how it covers things, this is how issues, and we simply accept that these things are ready made to be consumed and we don't challenge actually the structure and the questions of what the things we're consuming are. So for me it's a radical space of redreaming those things. I would like to see an alternative media that actually engages themselves and is critical of themselves as a media and a media that opens up new possibilities. I think that how can we begin to, my big question would be, how can we begin to dream outside of the ghettos of the imagination we exist in and into outer space? Mm. If we take that as where the further, furthest sure. realm that we can maybe dream. And I think that everybody has potential to dream and media can become the vehicle to unlock that potential and to open up new dreams. So in the commercial media's newsrooms, it's a dictatorship. From the owners to the editor to the reporters, decisions get made. Tell us a bit about the alternative media projects you're involved in, the, the, the culture within the newsroom or the editorial team. I, I think um, the difference with alternative media, and because you're not regarded as popular, you don't have the same um, influence from advertisers or corporates telling you what to do. Because very often the exact thing that 
I'll give an example when um, Safe Age uh, was going on about having labels identify what are the things that um, are included when you're making use of genetically modified. Um, when, for example, 786 was running programming around that to support that, not just to support it, because as media we have an obvious an obligation to, to inform people, but to bring about that message. Um, we had companies contacting us already that was based in Johannesburg and we are Cape Town based radio station. And we were, th were threatened at, at some stages for why, because obviously of those kinds of interest groups. So um, very resource intensive. Your, your journalist obviously in the newsroom realizes that you know what, they are telling a story that's not popular. So very often um, you have funding issues, um, um, you are marginalized, and these are the kinds of things that you know that you must work around to get the message out. Um, I think the, the point that she also made is besides creativity, I think it's also um, to be ethical and to keep to your responsibility as an alternative media that your, one of your main focus points and roles is that you become the watchdog for the society. Mm -hmm. You have an obligation to tell that story because you, 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 people rely on you to create, again, the access. Um, when, um, like we saw in other countries, for example, when there's a particular line, when the media is owned by particular corporates or interests, or the, um, then you see a particular view that's being pushed out. Mm -hmm. And I believe that alternative media has an obligation to show people what are the other views. Yeah. So alternative media treats their audiences like adults that can think. Yes. But beyond facilitating a discussion about what's happening in society. Historically, Anela, your comments, alternative media has also played an important organizing and mobilizing role. Yes. Um, I mean, there's a lot of examples um, in South Africa and also outside that actually um, it's not just about informing, but it's also about in many ways organizing society. Um, what I was trying to say earlier on is that um, for a lot of times, you know, we are told this is the line. Um, if not, um, we are told to buy this or buy that. Um, and, and I think if ever, you know, um, media is doing its, its work, um, then the question should be what for and for whose interest, um, you know, are all these lines for. Um, and I suppose then if, you know, the community is, is, is informed in that sense and organizing, then maybe we would have different values in our society um, than the ones we have. Um, every, I mean, every time you look into, I don't know, a billboard or a newspaper, a TV, you know, we, we are told of a certain lifestyle that we sh we're supposed to be living. Uh, and I think a lot of people um, social movements and labor uh, movements actually have been calling for a new society um, and the new um, um, uh, values of society. And, and I think um, what then needs to happen is precisely that the media is supposed to be within um, those groups agitating for a new society. Um, and I think Bush radio in many cases um, before 94 and sometimes now um, have played that role. Yeah. yeah. There are examples of, of publications, I mean, your Chimurenga, for example, that do bring together a progressive community and facilitate a discussion. Uh, tell us a, a bit about the kind of activism that Chimurenga is hoping to engage people in. I, I think Chimurenga is, it's quite a diverse project Maybe and I think. Well, I'll hold up what our new project is. Um, this is the latest issue of Chimurenga. We normally come out as a journal, but we've chosen quite specifically to make an intervention in the medium of the newspaper. Um, it's our idea to redream the newspaper. Um, I think that we, these newspapers have become quite t hot topics of the moment. There's a lot of discussion. They're becoming redundant. They're becoming... And I think we believe that it's a medium that a lot of people still engage with in an important medium, and yet a hugely undervalued medium. So. We did a newspaper as an art intervention. The Chimaringa Chronic, which you see here, is actually a once-off edition of an imaginary newspaper that travels back in time to reimagine the future. Yeah. So we've set it at the time of the xenophobic attacks, um, quite specifically because we wanted to intervene, I think, in the way that the media 
covered or looked at that, but also in what the way that the media covered or looked at that tells us about South Africa as a society and shapes South Africa as a society. So it's an intervention into the culture of emergency and exception that I think dominates our media. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, I've been a reader of Chimurenga for many years, and it's one of the few voices that really spaces, giving space to voices that really talk about a pan-African, post-colonial society, the kind of creativity and issues of identity and so on that we need to be grappling with if we're going to break with our apartheid past. Mm -hmm. So I think Timurenga, Radio 786, uh, the Amandla magazine is another example of alternative media that is available in Cape Town now. When we come back from the break, we're going to continue the discussion and look at some of the challenges and opportunities for alternative media in South Africa today. Welcome back to Free Media, Free Minds, and we continue our discussion about alternative media. And Nele, we've, we've seen examples of magazines, newspapers, and radio, but what other forms of media does alternative media take? Yeah, I mean, I think when we talk about media, a lot of people would want to look externally. Um, and I think what we've been trying to say is that actually we have um, um, some kind of ownership in some of the media um, and some mediums. Um, one which is an old, you know, uh, tool is oral traditions, you know, storytelling, poetry. Um, it's very important. It has helped in terms of telling stories and living um, um, experiences that have been lived before, you know, are carried through generations to generations. Um, the use of posters, stencils, graffiti, is very important. Um, you have um, your websites. Um, there's, I mean, a new revolution with the um, new media, your Facebooks and, and whatnot. Um, so there's, there's a lot of them, um, you know, yeah. And music. I think that exactly. music is, is, <laughs> yeah. a, is a huge device for media, for getting messages out, for mm. bringing people together and for challenging the mainstream. And yeah. I think that we, as, as Chimarengo, one of the things we always try and do is, is include a music yeah. event. So we publish both on the page and in the air as sound. Um, well, I mean, yes, one of the key uh, principles of alternative media has been, for me at least, uh, to be the media. Mm -hmm. That it's actually people's voices, it's owned and controlled mm -hmm. in some way uh, mm -hmm. more democratically than the commercial, and it gives yeah. voice to mm -hmm. the community. Uh, yeah. I'd, I'd also like to make a point is that beyond that, because radio is seen as something that happens now and immediate, and we know very often that with um, commercial media and um, the, how they run the mainstream stories is that it's what happens at the time, what's in the news, what everybody's talking about. Um, alternative media also, I think, has a responsibility beyond, um, beyond just that, the program. Um, and how we try to couple that with some of the with some of the projects that we got involved with is that during the time of elections, um, when all the um, the different parties had something to say about what they have to offer, Seven Eight Six decided to do it a, a bit differently. We had a series of programs that's running up until today, even post elections, um, that was called People's Parliament, where you actually invited the parliamentarians, the party um, leaders and the stakeholders within that community to the community. And you had the people there and they had to come and explain because the reality is, um, the reality is, is that they stand on platforms and they don't know what the people's issues are. So we took them into homes. We had 26 people sleeping in a one bedroom room. Now how and what are the issues that you have to deal with? So we just felt also that alternative media obviously has a responsibility beyond um, just the program that you're wanting to fill airtime for at that particular point. That we, what we actually do is, is that up till now we still run the People's Parliament. So basically it's service delivery issues. And you have these stakeholders and the, and the, um, the councillors of the area making promises and saying to people, we're going to get this done. 
So what 786 does is six months later, we actually go into the same area and we say, but hang on, you said it was going to take you three months because that is part of our, our responsibility to ensure that people's conditions change. Yeah. I think that that issue about how one covers things and that I think we tend to segment things and now we have the issue driven stuff and now we have yes. the entertainment stuff and, and I think that they actually bleed across. Um, you know, with our latest issue, the Chimuringa Chronic, we, we've, we focused on xenophobia. But in covering that, it's not just about giving stories that look at that event or the issue, but also in how you cover the arts affect xenophobia, what you choose to cover, how you choose to cover Africa's relationship with us on everything from food to sex to clothes to all these things actually are related. So I think it's not about creating those little sections where we go, now we have um, education and now we have issues and then we have entertainment. They're all interlinked. Mm -hmm. We, and we course, live in a doing, complex doing world. Doing the follow-up that you're talking about, because the commercial media, it, they've got a slogan that says, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> if there's blood, it's on the front page. Yeah. But never going back and unpacking that story, teasing out the root causes, yeah, exactly. and then following up, yeah. as you say 786 is doing. Exactly. Um, similar to um, what Stacey was saying now is, is during the xenophobia, as we went out of our way to say to people, but South Africa is not a country on its own. It's mm. Africa. Yeah. Because that, that was some part of the challenges and the issues that you had to deal with. Yeah. We um, obviously in commercial media is what's popular and it's what sells at the time. Yeah. I mean, I, w I would like to just come in and say something about that in relation to this project because one of the huge learning curves for me was the amazing thing of we, we created a newspaper in 2010 and 11, though we worked on it, but it's set in 2008. And yet I challenge anyone to find a story in this paper that is dated. News doesn't stop happening. Yeah. Just because the time has changed, <coughs> all those stories that were big and happening in 2008 still are still happening. It yeah. doesn't mm. change. Stories continue. Yeah. They're, they're not and, stories, and they're lives. They're, yeah. they're the world. And key to alternative media is helping us better understand so we can act. Mm. In, in South Africa, we've got the commercial media, the community media, and of course the public media, which uh, when we broke with apartheid was now no longer a state broadcaster. And then it, could, you, could we start to imagine the SABC as an alternative to the commercial media, as part of the alternative media family? Um, I would wish, um, yeah, to, yeah, to hope that, you know, that would be the case. Um, but I think in many ways, SABC has proven otherwise. Unless, you know, the community itself gets involved um, in reclaiming, you know, um, the broadcasting company. Um, and actually running it, you know, um, because what actually happens now, you know, of course, I mean, there's a couple of good people involved in, um, in the board and whatnot, but, um, but a lot of, you know, what then gets played or decided to be played, it's decided by a couple of, you know, a section of, 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 of the population, not necessarily the majority. So I think it goes back to, uh, you know, who owns what and how do we, um, you know, challenge some of these things. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a lovely idea. I think that that should be propagated more. Let's reclaim the SABC yeah. and it should be an issue that's on more people's table yeah. and more people should, are fighting for. It mm. should and uh, we'll in, this, in the course of this series we are speaking to the say of our SABC campaign mm. uh, who have a vision for public broadcasting that does serve the public and not uh, the elite as yeah. unfortunately the SABC with the exceptions does. Mm. Of course, financial sustainability is, is really the problem with the SABC, that they're so dependent on advertising. Is that a big challenge for alternative media? Very much so. Um, obviously, because when you're, seen as, when you're labeled or seen as alternative media, then you, you find yourself out in the cold. <laughs> you're marginalized because of particular stances that you take or views or people that you get on, on your media to, to express those views. And, and um, uh, corporates basically wouldn't want to touch you and so it affects your funding. I also find that with alternative media it's very resource intensive because you have to do more research to get behind the story. You don't just run it the way the mainstream is saying and, and sadly so within community media that is a lot of, because news is so expensive, it's, it's the most, one of the most expensive things at, at, at the radio. Um, what happens is, is that when a, a, a story breaks then they latch onto what the mainstream is saying 
Um, we with alternative media is alternative media is, is that you try and get out there to find out what is the story, doing your own research, speaking to a variety of people to get down to the actual issue surrounding the story. So yes, funding is a problem. It is a big issue. I think that there's also a challenge to the alternative media is to also look at strategies that they use. I think that one of the focuses we had in the chronic and one of the things that we looked at was what are the radical strategies that are being used in elsewhere in Africa where actually we never, there are people are in a much more oppressive media environment and yet an alternative media continues to exist and people are using mm. radical mechanisms of satire. Give us a few and examples, I, I, Well, I think one of my favorite examples, and it was a bit more of an historical example, but was that Fela Kuti, um, <coughs> was the famous musician, Afrobeat musician in Nigeria, um, what he started to do was, in the classified section, he started to take out adverts and he would pay for them, so they would, it would just go into their system and obliviously be placed, but that he would actually be putting out very politicized anti-government messages mm -hmm. using that mechanism. I think that that was a wonderfully genius. And in fact, he did it so regularly that it became almost a column, and people would buy the paper to read Fela's column in the classifieds. <laughs> so I think that that's a wonderful case of somebody being incredibly inventive and also yeah. just incredibly taking power saying, you can't actually keep me out. I'll play by your rules, but I'll subvert yeah. your rules. So and something that South Africans yeah. need to learn. Creativity and doing a lot with a little, I think, because people in alternative media have a vision and a passion yes. for telling a story which is not the dominant story. I mean, in South Africa today, job losses every quarter, fewer and fewer jobs. The media doesn't tell us that story at all. You have to read the dense text of the business pages in the middle of the Cape Times to learn about what's really going on in South Africa. And uh, I want to wrap up by thanking you for, for joining us this evening. We've got a taste of what alternative media is and what it could be. And I think we'd, we'd be in agreement if we said that we'd like to see sooner rather than later a uh, daily newspaper, national newspaper, TV and radio stations that tell the story from the perspective of ordinary people and invest properly in newsrooms, properly in journalism, properly in the creative arts to produce rich media products that can help us understand our world so that we can act on our world. Because I think in the end of the day, alternative media must be about change. It's not pretending to objectively reflect Mm. But alternative media is saying this is what's happening and this is where we think it can be different. So it's a people's media. And on that note, I want to thank the guests for coming into the studio. And uh, the viewers, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good.